Association and the creator of today's program, Off the Legal Cuff. I'm super excited to introduce this program. It's a new monthly program where we'll be discussing the hottest legal topics dominating the news with a rotating panel of influencer guests. One of our law student ambassadors, Ajaya Woods, will be the host for today. So with, uh, without further ado, I'm going to throw it to Ajaya and let you take over. Jay, I think you're muted. I'm not sure if you're getting a message. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Let me reverse pretend that did not happen. <laughs> uh, thank you again, Bella, for your kind introduction. And thank you to all of our incredibly accomplished panelists for joining the discussion today. Additionally, I also want to thank everyone who is tuned in to today's program. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, I invite you to comment your thoughts and questions in the chat. Those of you who are on Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature. And everyone, of course, is invited to connect with Beverly Hills Bar Association on Twitter and Insta to share your thoughts that way. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists. Joining us today, we have Crystal Delgado with over 20 years of experience in the business and entertainment fields. Crystal has made a name for herself as top music attorney on YouTube sharing her perspective on some of the hottest issues in the industry. Thank Hello. you for being here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, we also have Angela Harrison, known as the aspiring boss on YouTube. Angela has built an outstanding online community, which aims to motivate, educate, and inspire others, particularly individuals seeking to pursue a legal career. So shout out to all of the law students and pre-law students. Thank you, Angela, for being here. Hey y'all. Next, we have Lee Wallace, known on YouTube as Harvard Lawyer Lee. She is also here with us today. And having been in trial practice for 30 years, Lee brings her depth of knowledge and experience to her riveting videos discussing some of the hottest trials and litigation matters. Thank you for being here, Lee. And then last but certainly not least, we have Alita Mazeka, otherwise known as Legal Bites on YouTube. In her videos, Alita breaks down the law into bite-sized pieces so they're understandable, relatable, and interesting. Thank you for being here. And thank you all again for being here. We really appreciate it. Before we delve into the nitty gritty, I'm going to give a brief overview of the topics so that the viewers have a better understanding of what we'll discuss. And then we'll break it down by topics. And as soon as I'm done kind of giving the intro, it's just up to you guys, off the cuff, say whatever comes to your mind. So we'll start off with Nicki Minaj's defamation suit against a blogger. Then we're going to discuss a screenwriter suing Disney for the Muppet Babies reboot. After that, we'll talk about Kanye West's new school and its NDA requirement for families. And then to end our discussion today, we will touch on the settlement between Netflix and the Grammy Award winning The Unofficial Bridgerton Musical. Okay, so we're going to start off with Nicki Minaj, for those of you who haven't heard, the Grammy-nominated rapper is seeking $75,000 in damages in a defamation lawsuit against Marley Green, better known as blogger Nosy Ho, H-E-A-U-X. According to Nicki's petition, the blogger allegedly made outrageously defam defamatory comments about Minaj and her family, stating in a video that received 2,000 likes on Twitter and over 260 retweets. And I quote, this is a quote, everybody. Uh, Nicki Minaj is a cokehead. Her husband is a rapist. Without getting too much into it, Angela, I'm going to throw it to you. Uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I am not a litigator. I'm a transactional lawyer. So this took me all the way back to law school, uh, my torts law school class. And my first thought was defamation. I remember that being very, very hard to prove. But then I thought to the world we live in now, and it's even more different from when I was in law school, however many years ago. And I thought that this is definitely a case of Nikki trying to make an example out of Nosy Ho and other bloggers um, who just think they, they can say whatever they want on the internet without any consequence. And what really makes me think that is the amount of the lawsuit. 
$75,000 and this person doesn't have a, you know, a huge platform. This is definitely Nikki trying to make an example out of bloggers. And um, I, I'm not a Nikki Stan, I'm not a Barb, but I, I honestly, I don't blame her. Uh, we live in an age today where people literally say whatever they want on the internet and it gets shared and people take it for truth. And so as a businesswoman, as a brand, you know, I, I, I think it's not a bad idea to start going after people and making sure they're, you know, making, not making false reckless statements on the internet. Absolutely. So not a barb, but you're kind of siding with them in this case. You know, I listen to a little Nikki here and there. (laughs) (laughs) Anyone else have thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I'll jump in. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I was also going to, no, but you first, you first. (laughs) Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, so I dove into this a little bit because I was just interested in this uh, Marley Green, right? So I just kind of dove into a little bit of what she's doing. And the first thing that stuck out to me is that she's a pretty small blogger. So on her YouTube channel, I think she has like 18,000 followers. And then in the actual um, complaint, it was just saying, well, you know, the, this this tweet had garnered so much attention, 2,000 likes, more than 250 retweets. And I'm like... 250 re- just that that's not really that much in the world of Nicki Minaj and how much she's talked about on a daily basis so personally as I kind of dug into this I kind of felt like it was actually more retaliatory than anything because it seemed odd that she would be taking the time and bringing more attention to this right if an artist is going to sue someone that in itself is going to kind of put a spotlight on what the issue is right so for all those reasons, I kind of dove into it and Miss um, Green had done a live stream just kind of explaining her position. And she talked about the fact that she had encouraged uh, Jennifer Hugh, who was a rape victim of Nicki Minaj's husband back in 1995, I think it was. And so she's like, I had encouraged Jennifer to go and actually talk and vocalize you know, her frustration with Nicki Minaj reinvigorating the conversation and being like, you know, they had been in a relationship when this had happened, you know, they were both 16, but they were in a relationship. And so she was basically saying that, you know, my argument is I'd encourage Jennifer to come forward. She did. It created a lot of bad buzz for Nicki Minaj and her family. And because of that, now this is kind of the Trojan horse, right? So she's saying, you know, she is coming after me based on these defamation claims. Um, but it's because of actually this other issue. So I think that's actually what's going on here. Yeah, I think there's a lot going on um, because I kind of looked into it as well. And if you read the complaint, it says something about the fact that Nosy Ho, I feel weird saying that, but Nosy Ho was potentially hired by someone to, to do these things. And um, like I said, I follow Nikki a little bit and I've noticed that she has made you know claims in the last couple of years about certain people in the industry trying to, you know, bring her down. And a lot of people have been saying, you know, she's just kind of making these crazy accusations, but she specifically mentions a certain artist. I don't think she says the artist's name, but she mentioned an artist that is essentially hiring Nosy Ho and other bloggers to write negative things about her. And so I think it has something to, I do think it's retaliatory. So I do think it has something to do with that too, but I wasn't aware of her connection with the victim of her husband. So that's very interesting. I was just going to say that to me, um, this case is, it kind of in some respects feels a little bit like a Cardi B 2.0. Cardi B famously sued Tasha K, um, a YouTube blogger, vlogger, but has someone who has a, a much, much, much bigger channel, um, won almost $4 million in, in damages through that case. But, you know, that was all, that was a, it was a case that the, the reason why it, it seems very similar to me is because in that one, you know, you had these outrageous claims that were basically sort of like going down the list of defamation per se, you know, saying that she was a, a prostitute saying she was a drug dealer, saying she had STDs, all this kind of stuff. Um, but you know, it, it, it was a case where you had someone that was making video after video after video. And this is somebody who continued to make videos after a, uh, a cease and desist letter was, was sent over. And, um, 
and, and which is, so, you know, it's, it's, there was a, a much longer sort of history of this person making these kinds of, of claims. Now, this case, I definitely agree that this one, it sounds similar in the like outrageousness of the claims. Um, but if it's sort of like one, one series of statements, it's, it's different. And, and yeah, and, and I do agree that there, there does seem to be a bit of a, a, a Barbara Streisand effect, so to speak. So the, the, the famous case of Barbara Streisand, you know, sort of making, making a big deal about her, her address when photos were, were of Mal, of her Malibu home were like out on the internet and she like sent a cease and desist letter. And suddenly people had an interest of like, oh, why does, why does Barbara Streisand not want people to see her home and all that kind of stuff? Anyway, I just, interesting, interesting stuff. <laughs> well, I, and I think even, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. As a litigator, I was really struck by how harsh the language was around this, the rhetoric. Like, for example, in the complaint, I mean, in the complaint, there were actually statements that in a different age, Green's lie would have been meaningless because she is the ultimate nobody. And then there was another about this is the age of social media, one in which a nobody can find an undeserved following. And if as a litigator, I would never want that in the complaint because I want my client to be really relatable. You know, I want the jury to feel like I can relate to you. I can connect to you. And there were things that could be argued that would make Nicki Minaj relatable. Like she are, she alleges things were said about her child. Well, anybody who's a mom could relate to that or a parent could relate to that. There were, you know, the statement that um, she was a coquette. If, if she's not, that's hurtful. You know, people could relate to that. And I thought that put up a wall between Nicki Minaj and the rest of the world, including the jury. And so I thought that was a mistake. I also do agree uh, with what Angela started out by saying, which is that this is really about making a point. And Minaj's lawyer pretty much said that. He issued a statement that says, when this case is over, she, meaning Green, will no longer be permitted to use the name Nosy Ho because we will take her trademark from her when she does not have enough money to pay the judgment. Anyone else who spreads lies about Nikki will suffer a similar fate. My marching orders are to aggressively sue anyone with a media or social media following who damages her with intentional lies. Eventually, the lesson will be learned. And that sort of rhetoric, I guess, definitely does, uh, you know, Angelo, what you were saying, which is it makes a point, just as he says, it tells people, even if you're a smaller blogger, we're, you know, we'll come after you if you say anything. Which, but I'm not sure that that's the image that she would like to project in the world. Well, and it goes back to my point of just this doesn't make her look very good as far as, you know, what's what's really going on here, because number one, any comments about her husband being a rapist, he was convicted in 1995. So the best offense to a defamation claim is truth. Right. And I think this goes a little beyond that. There was a comment your baby is going to be or your baby is going to be a rapist, too. So there's other things going on here. But, you know, obviously we look at the truth of the matter as a starting point. But for me, not only the fact that this was a smaller or is a smaller blogger in general and the focus to go after her, but also, uh, but also, I'm drawing a blank actually for what I was just about to say. Oh, but in regards to we're going to take your trademark, that being, being that aggressive publicly about it speaks volumes to me. It's not just about obviously how the attorney is making her look because like attorney, like client, right? Because he's speaking on behalf of her. But again, all this is just kind of ringing as there's something else going on here. And I think that's something else is that this is just, you know, with that retaliation. Yeah. I, and I thought think, it, oh, okay. sorry. No, I, I was just going to say quickly that I, I also thought that the, the, the point about her calling the defendant a nobody uh, also oddly would, I would think would diminish the damages. Because you, all you do, uh, all you're doing is saying that there's really no audience for those statements. So, you know, what, what kind of damages could you possibly claim? I just, I, I thought that was a little bit perplexing. No, I agree with that. And again, I, I don't think, I don't even think it's about, you know, winning the case. It's, if you're a small creator, you know, a suit like this, you're, it's going to cost a lot of money. You know, we all know litigation takes a lot to defend. So I think she's definitely trying to make an example. And, and I'm, I'm kind of torn because on one hand, as a creator, I do not like anything that would create a chilling effect on people being able to speak freely. But also as a creator, I've had people say really just messed up things 
to me and about me, you know, and I'm a, you know, I'm a very small platform. So I can't imagine what it's like to be at that level and people saying just anything they want to say and, and you, you get away with it. And, you know, there's no consequences. So it's definitely an interesting um, case in the, the fact that she's even going after this, but I really think it is just, she's trying to make an example out of this person. Yeah. And it's like, why, you know, why did this hit a nerve for her? Right. Is it because it's true, you know, but as far as her and uh, Nicki Minaj actually did a live stream and she was addressing these drug allegations and, you know, it's tough because I think that in defense, Miss Green might present some, you know, video of, or many, many of videos of Nicki Minaj seeming to be doing drugs. She has this kind of ongoing issue with sniffling, which she also addressed in her live stream, where she's like, it's very cold everywhere I go. And, you know, so she's, this is an issue that's very important to her for, for some reason. And obviously there's more to it as I kind of went into it, but I, just going back to, you know, obviously truth is the best defense to defamation. So, you know, I think if Ms. Green can prove <laughs> Nicki Minaj does cocaine, then, uh, you know, Nicki Minaj is going to have some, some troubles. <laughs> And I think Nicki Minaj's complaint sort of stuck her out there waiting for something bad to happen to her there because all she has to prove would be that she's not a cokehead and that she isn't constantly putting coke in her nose, whatever the exact phrases were. If those are false, then it was defamation. But instead, in her complaint, what she said was that she had never done cocaine. Never. What that does is it gives, it throws down the gauntlet for the defense. They're like, great. All I need to do to prove you're a liar is go out and find one incident somewhere, sometime when you actually use cocaine in 10th grade. I don't care when it was, but something. And I, I think a strong statement like that, if you can avoid that in the complaint and just focus on what you have to prove, makes your life easier as a litigator. Before we move on, honestly, Amazing, amazing discussion, everyone. I love to hear everything that people are bringing to the table. Before we move on to the next topic, I am curious to hear a few of you kind of touched on this, just like the chilling effect, the precedent set or maybe not set by the Tasha K. Cardi B case. What are your thoughts? Maybe one or two of you can speak on what are your thoughts moving forward? What precedent is this case, the Tasha K case, similar cases going to set for, um, celebrities who are beefing, honestly, with small creators? Well, I think um, not too much of a precedent, to be honest. I mean, because we're still talking about public figures here. So we're talking about defamation cases that have where they have to show actual malice. So they have to show not only that that they lied, but that the defendant lied, either knowing that what they were saying was false or that they were being reckless with the truth. Um, and that was that was the thing that really got Tasha Kay in that case is that she literally admitted in open court that she basically was reckless uh, with the truth. So so actual malice is is normally the really, really big hurdle in these kinds of cases. And especially where we're, where we're talking about influencers who are talking about, you know, talking about these these celebrities or other social media influencers based off of information that they received, um, mere negligence, negligence is not going to be enough for these cases. Thank you. Okay. So let's move on now to our next topic. We are going to delve in to some recent drama at Disney regarding a possible copyright infringement with the Muppet Babies reboot. For those of you at home who don't know, a writer of the 1980s Muppet Babies animated TV series claims the company misused his work for a 2018 reboot of the show. Most recently, U.S. District Judge Stanley Blumenfeld has rejected Disney's request to dismiss this, the claims. So the suit is going to go forward. Any thoughts on the matter and possible outcome of the case? Um, Lee, why don't we start with you? Okay, I think it's a really interesting case. One of the um, one of the first things is this is sort of a cautionary tale about listing everything in your bankruptcy case, because this case was initially filed a year ago and he had to dismiss it. The creator did had to dismiss it because it hadn't been listed in his bankruptcy pleading. So they spent a year going back into the pleadings, trying to open up the bankruptcy case and then starting the case over again. And now some of the things in the second case 
may conflict may conflict with some of the things in the first case. So it created a problem. So it's like reminder, always tell your clients, whatever you do, list everything in your bankruptcy and make sure if you, they have a case that they've listed it. I think the thing that is probably going to be Disney's biggest problem is that in 2016, before, 2000, before 2018, when Disney came out with the Muppet Babies um, production, the creator actually met with them and gave them some ideas, talked to them about what he thought, you know, some things that he wanted to do that he had ideas that he had for creating a reboot. That means that they had sort of a free dump of his ideas. And they made what I thought was a pretty bad argument, really, that we only pay if we hire you to write the script. We don't just pay you for ideas. And that's just a terrible argument. That's exactly what they pay for. I mean, that's exactly what Disney is all about is the ideas that are behind their creations. And the court rejected that pretty freely said, you know, now that's, that's not the law here in the ninth circuit. And, you know, it's our, it's your custom anyway, to pay people for ideas and scripts. And you even have a history of paying this guy. So we don't buy that. I think that's going to be sort of a weak link. Their biggest argument is probably going to be their argument that what he said was not what his ideas weren't substantially similar to what we ultimately use. That's probably where the case will mostly end up. Awesome. Does anybody else have any want to weigh in on it? Sure. So, you know, this guy, as I was looking at his uh, his resume of things he's done, I mean, this is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle guy. This is the DuckTales guy. This is the guy. So a part of me is just I'm always I'm always just a little flabbergasted right so i'm an entertainment attorney my channel is top music attorney because i focus on you know musicians but as an entertainment attorney i've been doing this for you know eight years and it just shocks me when i'm dealing with like major labels major production houses film studios and we have this issue of like they just didn't get a contract which is the case here so a big piece um of the puzzle for me when i was reading the complaint is this production bible which um, the writer created in the 80s. And so as kind of consulting this production Bible that he created, which has a lot of these ideas and concepts um, that the reboot is based on, including a specific nanny character, they never got the rights to that Bible. And in fact, they don't have an agreement with him. And so when I say they, Marvel, Marvel then was purchased by Disney. Um, so for me, it's just amazing because they're under copyright law. If you don't have an assignment of ownership, or the copyright in writing, the original author owns it. So he owns his production Bible. And I got to say, I'm kind of rooting for this guy. I think he's going to win. <laughs> it's hard not to root for the little guy in these kinds of cases, though. I mean, right? <laughs> no, I agree. Exactly. I'm like, Disney, you got it. Just pay the man. <laughs> um, I, I, I read about this, this as well. And I was kind of looking at some of the details. And I thought I saw something along the lines of, he pitched a reboot to Disney, which if that's true, come on, <laughs> like pay the man, pay him. <laughs> awesome. So it sounds like from a lot of, a lot of you guys are saying this is a cautionary tale in more than one ways. Disney didn't cover their bases. The creator could have gotten to court a little faster. Um, so let's move on now. Next up, this is honestly my favorite topic of the day. I'm so interested to hear what you guys have to say about Kanye West's new school, Donda Academy. Uh, it is currently at 100 students. It's a Christian private school. And it's, of course, named after his late mother, Donda West. And according to the school, it aims to uphold a level of secrecy that is cemented with a signature from those who choose to attend, which is embodied in their mandatory non-disclosure agreement, NDA, that each family is required to sign. I am so interested to hear what you all have to say about this and what you think about this requirement. Do you think it's going to hold up in court? Alita, what are your initial thoughts? So, uh, of course, the first question is, you know, this is an NDA. We've got minors that are going to the school. The, 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 these NDAs are probably not actually signed by the minors, but by their parents, um, because that makes them, that would make them enforceable, um, or at least it would remove a barrier to enforceability is maybe a better way of putting it. But, uh, I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds here because 
on the one hand, when we're talking about children in a school, a lot of things can go wrong. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like the ability to, to talk about issues if issues come up, (laughs) but, um, at the same time, I understand that, that the kids that are going to this school are largely kids whose parents are sort of in the same sort of world as Kanye, so to speak. They, they are, they are also performers themselves. They are kind of maybe a bit more famous, so to speak. Um, so I could also understand that this could be a way to sort of ensure a level of privacy, not just for Kanye, but also for the other kids and the other families that are coming to the school. And that, that might be a, an actual draw for these, for these families to bring their kids in, but Ooh, I don't know. It still makes me a little bit uneasy to be honest. So basically the enforceability may not be an issue if everyone involved doesn't once that air of secrecy, but there are potential issues when it comes to just safety. Well, and a part of my question here was, um, it seems a little unusual for anything Kanye touches that he wants privacy and secrecy. He's very, very, very open (laughs) on social media about everything that's happening from his personal life, a very tortured breakup, uh, custody issue with children. I mean, he's got this recent issue with Adidas. And so he's, you know, even with his contracts for music, just going and spilling the beans and actually posting contracts when he's not supposed to, right? There's confidentiality in contracts he's posting. So the fact that he'd be like, oh, but for this thing, we're going to have an NDA. A part of me was just kind of like, I wonder if that's just a, you know, a document that just made its way in because legal overseeing what they were doing just added it versus it being like, no, this was something really thought out. We want to make sure it's private and no one can talk about this, you know, but I didn't inherently have an issue with it. What they're trying to do it's not proprietary but it has a feeling of being obviously very unique and special very high price point 15k a year but as i understand it with you know it's a very select group of students it's a very select group of teachers but these are like the superstar teachers and so maybe for all those reasons they just want to make sure that the kids can have the experience that they want to have so i don't necessarily feel like this is something where they're trying to hide something versus just maybe it's just paperwork that was added by legal yeah, I agree with that. I think it, I think some of the headlines probably are just being positioned that way for the media, but I doubt that the NDA is a huge deal as they're trying to make it. I have no issues with privatizing your children's education, although I'd be interested in like the intricacies, you know, just for my own nosiness, but I, I have no, no issues with private education. I don't see it as any different than sort of like a homeschool cohort or you know, whatever. So I have no issues with that. It's hard maybe to assess what the, how reasonable this is because there's so little information about what the NDA is. So if the NDA simply says you won't name the other parents and students, then maybe that's one level. But if what it says is you won't tell anybody your criticism of the school, you won't tell anybody about abuse, you won't tell anybody about the way you were treated, you won't tell anybody about the way others were treated, you will keep everything within this cone of silence, then that's a, that's a problem, not just in terms of optics, like it looks bad. <laughs> it looks bad if you need to ask people to do that. But it's also a problem in terms of the vulnerability of this population. I mean, imagine that being asked of you know, hospice, you know, or, you know, a nursing home, everyone has to agree, you won't say anything, you'll never critique us. There are just places in society where you have really vulnerable populations where it not only looks bad, but it also is bad to muzzle the people around that population who might keep it under control and protect people. Yeah, and I think also not legal (laughs) to do that. (laughs) Yeah, well, and Angela, I think Angela also said it. She's like, well, I want to know what's going on. And so yeah, obviously yeah. that could be a thesis of, well, that's why we want the NDA. We don't want everyone to, you know, privacy. But it did it did stick out to me. I think I was reading in an article that um, two separate families had come forward and, you know, volunteered. Obviously, I'm sure they were paid, but um, volunteered the information, just be like, yeah, they had to sign the NDA. And so, you know, I don't know if that was an opportunity for them. So more, it, to your point, it's like an opportunistic kind of thing. And now we're running headlines and getting some buzz on it. Um, I don't know, just something that stood out to me as far as that, you know, the families were the ones that were kind of reaching out to press to talk about it. That is definitely a great point that it could be a 
um, a way to kind of garner more interest or more publicity in the school. I do want to hear your guys' thoughts about just generally when it comes to NDAs and children and situations that could be kind of similar to this. Do you think that there should be any protections? If so, what? My initial thought is in a school setting, I know that in California, teachers are mandatory reporters. So if they do see any type of abuse, they are mandated to report. I don't know how that would interplay with children or families um, being bound by the NDAs, but just in general, I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts on any protections that could be in there. Yeah, so um, just in my experience, you know, there are carve outs when we're doing non-disclosure agreements, either the confidentiality language is in something else, right? It's like a work for hire or something, or you just have a freestanding non-disclosure and there's always exceptions. It goes, obviously you can't say anything. We're gonna sue the pants off of you if you do say something, but if you are required by law, right? So to your point of mandatory reporting, if you get subpoenaed, I mean, there are instances where, uh, you know, you'll have to disclose the information. So typically that's in the non-disclosure agreement, just like general templates, or at least it is for me. It might depend too on what the consequence is. Like if the consequence is you sue the 12 year old who posted pictures of his classmates on Facebook, now you're probably not gonna get away with that. But if the consequence is that the kid gets a five day suspension or that the kid is expelled from school, then probably they're going to get approval from that. Yeah, I mean, and to your question about what, like, overall thoughts on on NDAs involving children, it's hard to have like a like a blanket sort of thought about whether they are good or bad, because they can be good in certain situations, and they can be bad in certain situations, sometimes they can be a bit more protective, when we're talking about the spread of, of kids information. Um, but on the other hand, obviously, when we're talking about abuse, uh, when we're talking about situations where you know, kids are already maybe going to be less, less comfortable with coming forward to talk about certain things. And then there's a non-disclosure agreement on top of that. That's a situation where something like that would not be the best idea perhaps. Um, but I mean, yeah, to, to, to the points that have already been, been made, I mean, usually, usually they're going to be crafted in a way that is a bit more specific so that certain things can be talked about other things, not so much. Yeah, and I would hope that the NDAs, the, the main purpose is to protect protect the children and just for the types of people that will be attending, you know, safety, uh, you know, celebrity kids or rich kids and things like that. Those types of people are targeted. I've, I remember a rant from Kanye recently about the school that his children went to and he made this big deal. And I was like, Kanye, you've just told everyone where your kids go to school. So it's not really protecting them. So I would hope that the NDA is the main focus is to protect the children. I really agree with Angela and I would urge them to make it public. If that's the case, then why not release the text of what it is that people sign? Because then that would be fairly inoffensive and people would understand that. Great point. Great point, you guys. Okay, now we're going to move on. We're doing phenomenal for time. Um, we might answer after we get done with this last topic, we might go back and ask some questions from the viewers. If anybody has any questions, now's a great time to put it in the chat on YouTube or the Q&A on Zoom, and we'll try to answer those. So our final topic, though, Netflix recently dismissed its copyright infringement case against the creators of the Grammy award-winning The Unofficial Bridgerton Musical. Even though the claims were dismissed with prejudice, so it's not coming back, I'd love to hear what everyone's perspective is on whether fan fiction can go too far. Um, in its original complaint, Netflix, Netflix stated Barlow and Bears, which is the creator's conduct, began on social media but stretches fan fiction well past its breaking point. And it is blatant infringement of intellectual property rights. Crystal, I'd like to start with you. What do you think? Yeah, so okay, my understanding is that this all kind of started in December of 2020. Um, and so Barlow and Bear, they were posting a series of TikToks. So I think they were like fans of the point, but creatively wonderful individuals. And so they're doing these creative things on TikTok with like, you know, stuff based on characters and scenes and dialogue and plot points. And, you know, in copyright law, those technically, depending on what it is, it's a case by case thing, 
but we're talking about derivative works, right? So the way it works is that if you do like a remix of a song, um, then that would be a derivative work. There's copyright in the remix because it's based on something that someone owns, okay? So if they're creating this stuff, it's a derivative work. And so I think that was the basis for the lawsuit, which then came because Netflix was like, hey, we see what you're doing. It's very viral. That's great for our show. And we're okay with you having, I guess, uh, an album. Um, but they then adapted it to a live show. So they're making money. They're like, I think they even went on tour, right? We talked about the Grammy Awards. So this thing was really successful, but Netflix was upset about it. Now, in my experience with copyright issues, I find that it's usually the upset is about money, credit, or control, right? Someone's not getting paid what they're supposed to be paid. They're not getting the credit for the thing that they made, um, or they're not able to control it. In this case, you have someone who's now just doing a live show. And so, you know, I, I didn't read anything about trademark issues, but that would be a part of my question. You know, does the title give enough to, you know, help the consuming public understand that this is not an official Netflix thing? I think so. Um, but just as it relates to the copyright issue, I think that they got into the weeds. Everyone realized they were going to spend way too much money on litigation and decided to settle. So there probably is a little bit of that, you know, control, oversight, splitting of monies happening, but we don't know what the terms of the settlement agreement say. We never do, do we, Crystal? <laughs> I always want to see those types of things. Um, I think that Netflix liked it while it, while, while it helped them. You know, it was only doing good for them. I mean, that show was a hit until they started making some real money. And then that's when it became an issue. Um, and, I, and I can see it, you know, as a creator, I, I, I understand that. But I do think that they probably milked it until it became too profitable. There's such a tension in that because Netflix really did benefit for a long time by what they were doing. You know, when you have little shorts on TikTok and you're building up the enthusiasm for it, that's nothing but good. And it's interesting to sort of watch the progression of how Netflix handled what they were doing. When they were doing TikToks, from what I could tell, they didn't really do much of anything. It's like, okay, this is helping. Then they moved a little bit further and they went into an album. And they released songs about it. And Netflix apparently, you know, did write them, did talk to them, objected, tried to license their performances. And it just never worked out. But they didn't really take the step of suing. But as soon as they did a live performance, sold out expensive tickets, I think they were 150 to 350 per seat. That's when Netflix, three days later, dropped the hammer, filed the suit. Yeah, and I think I think that's a good point. You know, is this a jealousy thing, right? Was Netflix seeing the incredible success of the un unofficial Bridgerton musical and threatened by it? And so therefore they just wanted to stop, right? To actually enjoin it and to say, you don't get to use our branding and our copyrighted material. But maybe they thought better and said, no, let's just have a piece of the pie and let's settle. Well, I mean, I could see it. I could see it in two different ways, right? I mean, on the one hand, this is this is a dollars and cents kind of issue, right? It's once once it gets big enough, it's taking revenue away from Netflix, you know, at least in theory. And then on the other hand, this could also possibly create that trademark issue where it's where it's small, where it's these little TikTok videos and things that are that are clearly made by by fans, by creators. Um, and and clearly not by Netflix, right? It doesn't have the same sort of production value. The consumer is going to be generally uh, pretty clear as to where this content is coming from. But as soon as it becomes big enough to be a musical and then it starts winning awards and it starts really taking off, I can also see that trademark um, issue coming up with Netflix saying, look, people are going to think that this is us because, you know, or, either that this is created by us or that this was licensed by us and we have zero control over this issue you know so that i i i can i can see the lawsuit coming from that angle as well and you can see where netflix would be worried about losing control because they could take the characters in new directions <clears throat> they could you know add new characters things that netflix didn't have which could create all kinds of problems. Let's say Netflix stops filming and they do the unofficial sequel too, and it becomes the real Bridgerton, you know, after that. I'm guessing at some point in the near future, we're going to see the official Netflix special of the unofficial Bridgerton musical. <laughs> it's coming. 
Awesome. Okay, so we are getting close to the end of our time. Um, before we sign off, there's one question that I want to pose. Um, this is coming from the Q&A in Zoom. And this takes us all the way back to the beginning, to the Nicki Minaj case. Um, one gentleman asked, what, what are your guys' thoughts on the blogger Miss Green filing an anti-slap motion in that case? Well, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so, so to begin anti-slap stands for it's S L A P P stands for strategic litigation against public participation. It's basically where the defendant says that the plaintiff is, is improperly filing litigation against me, uh, in retaliation for, for acting on my first amendment protected activities, um, basically free speech. So in different states, you have different levels of anti-slap protection. In California, for example, it's very, very strong. Uh, there's a very strong mechanism in, in, in place. And uh, if you have been following the Marilyn Manson versus Evan Rachel Wood and Ilma Gore case, there's a very big anti-slap issue in that case. If you followed the Depp v. Heard case, that was one of the reasons why Depp filed in Virginia was because the anti-slap laws were much weaker than they are in a place like California. Um, so forgive me, but I, for, I forget which state this lawsuit was filed in. Um, but I don't think that it's California. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if somebody else wants to jump in on that. I think it's New York. Okay. So I don't know the anti-slap laws in New York, but I would, I would venture that, to guess that they probably are a little bit stronger in which case an anti-slap lawsuit I mean, or an anti-slap motion, sorry, you know, the defendant could file. Um, but if, I mean, anti-slap still doesn't necessarily, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I, I'm, I'm less familiar with, with New York's laws. Interesting. Yeah. And I would just say in my experience, um, it's usually, you know, motions to dismiss, but based on something similar, right? This is a baseless legal proceeding. They're doing this to harass and intimidate, which by the way, is something that came up with Nicki Minaj and her husband. And there's this whole backstory we didn't get into as far as the original victim, uh, you know, coming forth, talking about what had happened, trying to clarify that whole, you know, we were in a, or we were not in a relationship, but also saying and alleging that Nicki Minaj had um, intimidated her, showing up to her home, put $20,000 on her lap. So in any case, um, in my experience, it's been, you know, usually a motion to dismiss, but, um, but very interesting. And a slap motion. Awesome. Okay, so we are right about at time. So I just want to take another moment to share my gratitude. Thank you all for joining us today for our first installment of Off the Legal Cuff. This was an incredible discussion on all the different topics. And thank you to everybody at home who's either tuning in now or will watch it later. I want to make sure that everybody marks their calendar for the next installment of Off the Legal Cuff, which will be on Wednesday, October 24th. Thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.